Okay, so welcome to PXE International's extended annual conference this year, global conference. We're uh, doing this, as most of you know, over the course of the whole year, all the way to December. Um, we're finding this very useful because it gives the speakers more time to speak and you more time to give uh, to ask questions uh, and which they can answer. Um, a reminder that this is not about you specifically, and so you can have general questions about PXE, but if you have clinical questions about your condition, then we ask you to take them to your clinician, and if you can't find one, we're always happy to help you find one. Um, our series is also being recorded, and you can uh, listen to it on PXE International's YouTube channel, which one of the staff will put into the chat. Um, and uh, and everything we've done actually since YouTube started is there. So there's more than a hundred videos at any one time. Um, with me today, I have um, Kat Troutman and Georgia Bali, Bali both from um, PXE International. Uh, the staff's names that you've seen over and over uh, throughout the years, and we're delighted to to have them with us as well today. Um, you can ask questions at the end, and you can put those either in the chat, you can raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function, or you can um, uh, unmute yourself um, uh, when you get ready to ask a question. But again, let's wait uh, to the end. So today, um, we are quite fortunate to have with us all the way from the other side of the ocean for many of us, although some of you I know are even coming to us from South Africa today. Uh, so we have Sarah Risiu from the University Medical Center at Utrecht, and she'll be talking about the more clinical end of uh, PXE in the eye. And then Imre Lengel, who is from Queen's University in Belfast, uh, Northern Ireland, uh, and he will be talking about some of the fundamental science. Uh, both of them have been participating in PXE's um, annual research conferences for quite some time and part of the research consortium that your precious um, attention and support and so forth supports by us being able to help coordinate and hold meetings so that we can exchange information. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Sarah and Imre. You can decide your order and what uh, what you will project yeah, I think I think we 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 did a, a wise decision, and uh, we start with Sarah uh, because I think it's very important to to relate what I'm going to talk about to the clinical cases, uh, but also because I'm going to present a data, a, a recent data which Sarah was intimately involved, so it made a lot of th sense to to go in this order. It's Great. over to you, Sarah. Take it up, sir. Thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me well. Yes. I'll share my screen with you. Um, and Sarah, a reminder that some people have low vision, and so lots of describing what you're projecting is very useful. I'm sure as an ophthalmologist, you know that. So uh, I remind all the speakers. Yeah, of course. Um, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, perfect. Uh, okay, excellent. <laughs> then we'll start. So I want to thank you uh, very much for this opportunity to tell you something about the clinical ophthalmology in PXE. I am a ophthalmology resident at the moment, but I did a lot of research on the clinical side of PXE in the eyes, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher currently. Um, and in this talk, uh, I will uh, talk about what is PXC and what's actually happening in the eye so that you can understand what's going on and why we investigate things, what happens with vision. Then I want to talk briefly about how can we treat and monitor PXC in the eyes. And then we will briefly talk about the future directions uh, of research. And I'm very happy to answer any questions after this. So first, you might know what is VXC, but I always introduce it. It's a very rare disease with an estimated prevalence of at least 1 to 40,000, which means that um, at least 1 to 40,000 people uh, have this, but probably more. And it is caused by a double mutation in the ABCC6 gene. And this leads to ectopic calcification or calcification in places where it should not be. 
And in PXC, we know this is in the skin, in the neck. We know this is in the vessels and especially in the legs. This is very good visible. You can see here a scan and the white line that I follow with my cursor is a calcified artery. And we know that it presents in the eyes and especially in the Brooks membrane. And we can see that very well in different types of imaging, uh, for example, on this one. And uh, the where most well-known uh, aspects of PXC in the eye are endured streaks and powder orange. And I will go into that later as well. So what is actually happening in the eye? I first want to talk briefly about how, what, what is the eye and the anatomy of the eye? So uh, the eye is a, a globe of around uh, two to two and a half centimeters, uh, which is connected to the brain with a nerve. That's the yellowish aspect over here. So it's an extension of the brain. And in the front of the eye, that's over here on the left side, uh, there is the cornea and the lens, which are the things that are necessary for clear vision. When we want to see something, there is light in front of us or an object in front of us. And this light needs to travel through the cornea, through the lens, to the retina, which is at the back of the eye. It's sort of when you have a football and then the inside of the football, that is the retina. And that contains all the cells that are necessary to transmit any light signal to the brain. So when we want to see, we need to have uh, clear cornea and lenses, but we also need to have a good retina. This is how the retina looks uh, as uh, we look at it as ophthalmologists. So it is a bit orangey, depends a bit per person. You can see a white dot, and this is the optic nerve. This is the uh, direct extension to the brain. And there are some yet, uh, reddish lines, and those are blood vessels. And they give the retina the nutrients and blood. And then over here in the white circle, that is the macula. And the macula is the area of the retina, which contains the cells that are necessary for good and sharp vision, especially around here in the fovea. So this is the part of the retina that is essential when you want to have good vision, for example, for reading or for seeing faces. And when we make a digital cut through the retina, uh, you can see it over here. This is when uh, we do that with an OCT scan. We can see the different layers of the retina. And around here on the left side, you see a small dip. That is the fovea, that's already complete center of the macula. And there are different layers, they have different kinds of gray. And especially the uh, whiter layers over here, those hyper reflective layers. This we call the outer retina, and this contains the uh, cells and the layers that are involved in PXC. And these, those are the photoreceptors, the pigment, epithelium, and the Brooks membrane. I will come back on this later. So what happens in the eye when there is PXC? There is calcification of Brooks membrane, that very, very thin membrane that we can see on the cut through the retina. And I will show here an image that um, uh, Imre has made. He will show a lot more. But this is only two micrometers. So we have a very enlarged photograph of Brooks membrane over here. And everything that is orangey is hard material. That's calcification. So we can see that this membrane is very thin and is calcified. And we can see that on an OCT scan, on this cut through the retina as well. When we look at the hyperreflective layers, those colors are switched now. So everything that is more black is more hyperreflective. We can see that in PXE, the pattern is different. And especially 
in the lower layers, there is more reflective material, which corresponds with the Brooks membrane calcification. So this reflective material is actually calcification of Brooks membrane. And we can see that when we look at the back of the eye as well. So again, we can see the normal anatomy. So this is the optic nerve, and we can see the blood vessels coming out of the optic nerve. And here in the center is the macular area. But what is very typical for PXC are the endured streaks. We can see them. I indicated them with black arrowheads. And those are actually breaks of the calcified Brooks membrane. So maybe you can envision, for example, an eggshell. It's very brittle. And when it cracks, you can see those jack lines. And those endured streaks are more or less the same. We can see them around here. We can see them here. We can see them here. And what we can also see is the pattern of calcification of Brooks membrane. And it has a speckled aspect, and we call that powder orange. It translates to um, uh, orange peel. And you can understand that when you look at it. And powder orange, uh, we see that as the transition zone from a fully calcified Brooks membrane, which is over here, to a less calcified Brooks membrane, which is over here. We know that this calcification of Brooks membrane slowly progresses over the years. And especially when people are a bit younger, we can see that very good. I want to show you some pictures um, of a teenager in which we see the progression of endured streaks and powder runge. In this uh, imaging, the patient is 14 years old and we can see the speckled aspect, the powder runge around here, but we cannot see very big endured streaks. Three years later, we can see that the speckled aspect seems to move a bit to the right side, so to the periphery of the fimbus. And we can see in here now that there's an endured streak has formed to the macula. And even two years later, we can see that this endured streak we can see it over here, but we can also see it very good on the near infrared imaging has enlarged and spread even more towards the periphery. So in the course of five years, we can have we, we have a visible progression of both the uh, powder wand, which means that the Brooks membrane is getting more and more calcified, and also of the endured streaks. And we know that this progression happens during life even further after the first decades as well. When we look at the extent of endured streaks, so how long the endured streaks are, which is sort of a measure for how much calcification there is, we know that the older people get, uh, and on the x-axis you can see the arriving decades, we know that the endured streaks are becoming longer and longer. So during life, there is a slow progression of endured streaks and calcification. And we have studied this extensively and we found that there is a specific area in the retina which is predetermined for this calcification. But this calcification starts around the optic nerve and then spreads during life, slowly, 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 until this area appears to be completely calcified. But it doesn't go much further than that. So as a consequence of this calcification, we can get macular degeneration. And there are two important forms. There is the choroidal neovascularization, or the neovessels, which grow through the endured streaks. You can see that over here. You can see this thin line, and there's an interruption of the line, but you can see a growth coming out of it. And that's neovessels, and they can start to leak and bleed. And you can see an end stage fundus over here, which has a lot of bleeding and some scarring. Another form of uh, macular degeneration is macular atrophy, which can occur independent of the injured streak. And uh, this is a thinning 
of the retina. So to briefly go a bit more into the neovascularization, which is the most common type of macular degeneration in PXC, what is happening is that from the layers under Brooks membrane, under the retina, there are vessels growing up and there must be a break somewhere in the Brooks membrane if they want to go into the retina. And that's the problem with BXC. There are a lot of breaks of Brooks membrane. So these vessels have a lot of opportunities to grow through these breaks. And when they grow through these breaks, they can start to get some problems. These vessels are of bad quality and they can leak. So they can leak into the retina and we have intraretinal fluids. We can see that as some cysts as the black spots over here. And they can also leak fluids underneath the retina. And we can see that over here, the retina seems to be lifted by all the fluids and they arrive from this small bulb over here. And sometimes they can bleed as well. In here we can see a subretinal hemorrhage or bleeding coming from a, a neovascularization on top of an endured streak. And this bleeding is at a bit fortunate position because it's not in the center of vision, but it's above. So this is something that you might not notice um, in the visual field. When it is not active anymore, these uh, sub, uh, these new vascularizations, uh, they might leave some scarring. We can see that over here. We don't see any fluid anymore. It's not active. There is no bleeding, but there's this big white bump. And this is material that is fibrotic. So it's a sort of scarring material. It's not good retinal material. So the eye cannot see very well with this part anymore. What can you notice when there is neovascularization? So vision loss is one of the most well-known things. And the things that you could see before are less visible. What you can also notice is distortion of vision. We call it metamorphopsia. And what happens is that lines that are usually uh, straight can have some bends in it. Um, there is one tool and it's pictured here. We call that the Amsler grid. And it's a very useful tool. You can print it out from the internet to look at every week to see if the lines are the same or if there's a change in lines. But why I, oh, what I always say to my patients, you can also look at doors, which are usually have straight lines. And if there's uh, some sort of other shape in the line, that might be a sign as well. Um, what you can also notice is a blind spot. We call that a scotoma, which just means a, um, a focused loss of your visual field. And if any of these happen or worsen, it's necessary to contact the specialist. The other type of macular degeneration is macular atrophy. And this is sort of similar to the form of atrophy in age-related macular degeneration. We can see the fundus here, and the uh, lighter part is actually a loss of the pigment epithelium. We can also see that on the OCT scan. You can see that uh, the scan is through here, and we look at the normal uh, lines and layers of tissue. And we can see that around here, there is a stop of the um, most inner layer. So the, the reflective lines that I talked about earlier, they normally go everywhere on the retina, but they seem to stop around here. And that's not good because we need those layers of retina. Those are the photoreceptors and they're essential for um, uh, signaling the light signals to the brain. And this is the comparison. We need to have those lines. And here, we do not see them. So there is a loss of important tissue of the retina. 
So how does this impact the fission? We know that the older uh, people with a PXC get, the higher the chances are that there's macular degeneration. And the numbers go as high as uh, the majority of people over 70 years having uh, a form of macular atrophy. And of course, this also impacts the vision. Um, we know that when patients are around 40 years old, the first eye starts to lose vision. So this is the worst eye. Around the year 40 to 50, we can see that neo vessels arise. And that is the time that in some patients, the vision of this eye worsens. And then when we look 10 years later, we notice that the other eye might also lose some vision. So at the age of 50, we can see that uh, there's a large group which has already decreased vision of both eyes. But it's important to notice that there's a very large range. So there are patients who are over 60 years and have a very good vision, and there's patients that are uh, younger and have bad vision. So how, how is the natural course over life then? So, um, by seeing a lot of patients in our uh, center of expertise in the Utrecht uh, department, we got some sense of what happens uh, during life. And I want to briefly take you uh, through this. So when you are born with PC, you have the ABCC6 mutation and the calcification starts to happen. And during the first two decades, we can see that the polar orange starts to arise. And between 10 to 20 years, we always see the first android streaks. I, I maybe have seen one or two patients without android streaks, but almost everyone has those. Then we skip in time, and when patients are uh, 40 years or older, uh, we can see the first neovessels arise in the first eye, impacting vision. 10 years later, we can see that the second eye might also lose some vision and the macular atrophy might arise around these times. And then we found in our patient group from patients over 60 years that 45% is visually impaired and 10% is blind, which is a lot. But I think it is very important to realize that a lot of these people did not have access to the medication and to the treatment options that there are now. So I really hope that if we do this study again in 10 years, that these numbers will change. We know that there are factors that impact the risk of macular degeneration. And one of the most important factors is the amount of calcification. I have pictured here a fundus of a uh, around 50 year old female who has very small endo streaks, which uh, correlates to uh, lesser calcification, and there is no macular degeneration and good vision. Whereas here we have the fundus of a patient around the same age who has extensive endo streaks, extensive calcification. And we can see that there is scarring from neovessels. We can see macular atrophy. And this eye uh, has, has a very bad vision resulting from that. And we know that this is probably at least a bit due to more extensive calcification in the eye. There are some other factors that might also impair the vision or the risk of macular degeneration. And one of the most important aspects is the location of endured streaks. As we discussed, we know that the neovessels arise through the endured streaks. And you can imagine that when there's an endured streak in the center of the vision, I indicated that here with the arrow, there is a higher chance of getting uh, vision threatening macular degeneration than when there are no endured streaks in the macular area. 
There is another thing that we just learned uh, a few years ago from uh, Martin Glean from Bonn. And that is there uh, that, that some patients suffer from a so-called acute retinopathy. And this is a inflammation in PXC, which happens around the end of streak. And this is something that is not slowly progressive, but this can uh, present with a sudden change of vision loss. And you can also get light sensations or flashes or blind spots when this happens. And there's not a lot of experience with this yet, but since this is an inflammation, we tend to treat this with corticosteroids, um, which might be the correct treatment for an acute retinopathy. Blunt trauma, uh, which is, for example, um, uh, hit on the head, uh, or you get uh, struck by a football, for example, might also be a reason for PXC to progress in the eye. Uh, in here, you can see the fundus of quite a young patient, actually, but there are extensive endured streaks, which do not have the typical pattern. So we know that there's probably another force that drove those endured streaks. And there's a lot of scarring that the spider web uh, things like. Um, so this patient was hit on the head, uh, which caused, unfortunately, a lot of endurance to develop uh, and neovessels and bleeding to arise. And lastly, we know that some patients in PXC uh, have drusen of the optic nerve. And what are those? Those are deposits of uh, waste material in the optic nerve, and we can see them here as well. Normally, the optic nerve is uh, a beautiful circle. Around here, it's a bit bulgy. And this is um, uh, deposits of waste material. And in some cases, this can lead to blind spots. Previously, around 50 years ago, we know that some women were advised not to get pregnant or to have a C-section because there are thoughts that this might progress PXC in the eye or cause bleedings in the eye. And we studied this a few years ago um, and we saw that there actually is no worsening after pregnancy or a normal vaginal delivery as long as there is no neovessel. So, in our center, we always let pregnant patients come in the third trimester to check with the retinal exam if there are any new vessels. And if there's not, the patient is safe to undergo any normal delivery. And there are no indications for any other types of deliveries or C-sections. I want to tell you this explicitly because we get a lot of questions about this in clinic. We know that there are other aspects of visual functioning that might be impaired as well in PXC. We always test the visual acuity, which is that you have to read all the letters and we see how small they can get. But there are a lot of other types of vision that are important as well. For example, seeing contrasts or reading with less light. And we also know that the dark adaptation, which means that if you go into a tunnel, for example, and you go from a light situation to a dark situation, we know that PXC patients have more difficulty to adapt to the dark situation. So these are all some new uh, investigations, uh, which are the center of some newer investigations uh, of the ongoing years. Uh, but it is important to realize that it's not only the visual acuity or the uh, metamorphopsia or the, the visual distortion, but all types of aspects of vision can be impaired in BXC. So how can we treat BXC? Ideally, we want to treat the cause. So we want lesser calcification of these soft tissues. I will not go uh, into this uh, in this talk. I think there's so much to tell about and so many uh, things going on. 
Um, but there are some treatments under investigation uh, currently in different types of the world. Um, and we all hope that these will lead to positive results. What you can do for the eyes is having a healthy lifestyle. There are some supplements that are recommended for age-related macular degeneration, which are called AREX supplements. We do not recommend them for PXC. Since PXC has a different uh, cause than macular degeneration, these will not be helpful. And PXC is also considered as a metabolic disease. And we don't know what happens when we take all those supplements or different types of um, uh, vitamins. What you can do is good amounts of vegetables and fruits, especially green leafy vegetables uh, for the good pigments in them. And if people are smoking, they should really stop smoking because we do know that that is very bad for the vasculature in the vessels. When you have problems with vision or any aspects of vision, you might get some low vision support or some people that can help you with how you can adapt the light situation at home or um, uh, new glasses, for example, that might help you in your daily situation. And the only thing we can do now to treat something is to dampen the effects of neo vessels with injections in the eye. And we can do that since around 2006. So I think most of you have heard of this, of ng uh, What does it do? It inhibits uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, which is necessary for neo vessels. Uh, and it prevents the formation of new vessels. So it keeps them more quiet and it prevents them from growing. And there are a few types of those. The oldest is uh, bevacizumab, uh, which is originally anti-cancer medicine uh, and it's used off-label. And then there are ranibizumab and aflibercept. Um, some newer uh, anti-fetchef medications are brolicizumab and uh, farisimab. And of course, I only know the situation from the Netherlands, so I put them in, uh, in, in our experience. We know that um has some side effects uh, of inflammation. So this is something that in our clinics, we don't use very regularly. And since last year, we also had the option of ferricimab to treat patients with. And there are some um, uh, new things going on because these um, injections, they are quite expensive, um, but they will be made in some cheaper version, which are called biosimilars, which uh, has approximately the same molecules. And I don't know if we are already treating with that in the Netherlands, but I think that uh, this is development that we'll be seeing in the next couple of years and see how it will work uh, in practice as well. So when treating with anti uh, there are different types of regimes that can be used. Um, what we do is so-called treat and extend. So we do a loading phase of three injections every four weeks. And after that, if it is quiet, we extend the interval of the injections with one or two weeks. And then we extend to approximately three months interval. So what do we know about anti-VGF in PXC? In our clinical experience, we noticed that patients with PXC need more frequent injections and have some shorter intervals than uh, other diseases that we use anti-VGF for, for example, late AMD. And uh, we also know that because the disease is often very symmetrical in both eyes, that once treatment starts in one eye, there is quite a high chance that the other eye needs to be treated in the upcoming years as well. Though anti-VGF has, has been one of the biggest things in ophthalmology uh, since a few decades, um, there are some cons of this treatment. 
one of those is that it is uncomfortable. Um, it might give some pain and you have to come to the hospital every few weeks. And as always, there is a small risk of complications or infections. There might be some PXC specific risks, but we don't know that for sure yet. So we have the clinical experience that patients with PXC might have a bit more rise in eyeball pressure after the injection, but this is uh, currently under investigation. Uh, and it is unknown what the effect is on the vitality of the retina on atrophy because we reduce the growth factors, but the growth factors are also necessary to maintain some other parts of the retina. And then there's a discussion, do we need prophylactic treatment with anti-VGF? Um, in the Netherlands, uh, there is this trend of giving patients uh, who have been treated for a couple of years prophylactic treatment with every three months an injection. And uh, I think this always should be a discussion between the physician and the patient to discuss the uh, benefits, you know, the suppression of the neo vessels and not bleeding versus the risks and the, um, uh, the logistics of the patient. How do we monitor PXC in the Netherlands? It, it sort of depends on the patient, but we usually see them every few years while they are young. And once they start to get at risk for neo vessels, we see them approximately yearly. And when they are at risk, uh, they have central angular streaks or other risk factors, uh, we might um, see them a bit earlier as well. And when patients have end stage disease or they cannot see, uh, they, they, they are visually impaired. It sort of depends on, on what the patients want because sometimes there's not a lot that we can do anymore for them. And we always ask patients to self-monitor using the m grid. And of course, when patients are treated with uh, injections, it depends on the regime and we see them every few months. We do every visit the visual acuity and OCT imaging. And on indication, we do some extra imaging like autofluorescence or an m grid. So they are pictured over here. Those are the three modalities that we use the most extra in PXC. When we do a fundus autofluorescence, it's a very annoying imaging with a blue light. We can have a glimpse of the retinal vitality and we can look at uh, thinning of the retina, the atrophy, which is the um, black spot over here. Uh, but we can also get some indications of inflammation uh, that, that's very helpful for us to try to um, pick out the patients who are at risk for this acute retinopathy. And uh, sometimes when there's any doubt about whether there are new vessels or not, we might do a fluorescein angiography. This is an orange contrast dye, and we can detect activity if it's not very clear on the OCT imaging. And then there's this thing with a green contrast dye, called indocyanin green, uh, which we do specifically in PXC because there is a very typical pattern which is similar to powder orange, but it's not at the same place. And this is of a particular scientific interest um, because we don't really know what's going on over here and we are really trying to get it out. So what do we see happening in the future in PXC? Well, mostly we want to understand what's actually happening in Brooks membrane, and I'm sure that Imke will talk about this as well. Uh, so we want to understand why those specific parts get calcified and um, where this calcification is coming from. But another important task for us as researchers is finding clinical endpoints for both monitoring and research, um, because we just need um, imaging biomarkers, for example, on OCT, to see whether there's any progression of disease. So we can um, see patients back after a few years and say it's stable or not, or we can use that in trials and see whether some sort of treatment can actually help the calcification. Um, 
we found that uh, those hyper-reflective thoughts can actually be quantified. So we made the reflectivity profile of the retina and the black line is the reflectivity profile for patients with PXC. And there's this gray line, which is a control uh, reflectivity. And we can see here that the PXC patients have a higher reflectivity at the location of the Brooks membrane. And um, we are actually trying to make this a better measurement. So this can be implemented in clinical practice as well and can be used by other researchers to measure the amount of calcification uh, with only an OCT scan. Uh, some other research groups are also busy with the insight in visual functioning and investigating, for example, the impaired dark adaptation. And of course, the main thing in PXC is we want to treat it. And there are uh, some treatments under trial, but for us eye specialists, there's this one problem and we don't have this endpoint yet. So um, we need to work hard on that. That was my talk. I hope it was uh, clear, uh, though elaborate. And please let me know if there are any questions. Great. So uh, thank you, Sarah. Why don't we go to Ima Ray so that we have time for both talks and we'll see if we can get to questions. Thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, I will share now my screen. I'm, oops, I'm hoping that you can, you can see my screen. Yes, uh, we can. Yep. Super. So uh, uh, this was a, a fantastic introduction. I always love listening uh, what clinicians say because it's very important that our work in basic science is really matching up what the clinical uh, uh, picture, pl clinical expectation is. So I'm going to talk to you about something that was uh, originated from age-related macular degeneration. That's how we met with Sarah and we teamed up to, to uh, present what I'm going to present to you. So basically in age-related macular degeneration, calcification has been mentioned for quite some time. But recently we showed uh, with clinical cases as well as basic science that the atrophy that appears in age-related macular degeneration can very significantly sped up in cases where there is calcify calcification in the Brooks membrane and above the Brooks membrane called drusen. So if this is the case, uh, obvious, it was an obvious question how this calcification might be related to um, uh, what Sarah was talking about in Pseudosantum Elasticum, and how does uh, this hardening actually changes our vision? I'm, I'm sure you are familiar with Paddington Bear, and that's how his hardening view is. It's obviously not the same type of hardening view that you are experiencing in, uh, in your everyday life. What we can do uh, that clinicians cannot do is actually put tissues uh, that are uh, uh, received from donations, from uh, kind donations from patients, is we can interrogate this um, piece of tissue in a very detailed way using very high end analytical methodologies. I'm not going to show you every, uh, bit of this because I will show you examples what we get um, uh, out of this equipment. But basically what uh, I want to show you is that there are many different ways that a, a, a piece of tissue can be interrogated and the answers are all adding up to a full picture. Now the team who collected these tissues uh, uh, from Utrecht uh, were very kind to help us out with sending these tissues over. You have seen pictures like this from Sarah. Uh, but what was most important is that some of the tissues, like for example, what you see on the screen now, 
the C figure in the lower corner is actually a clinical image of the eye that was donated for research. So we were directly able to relate what clinicians see and what scientists can look at. We know that the major problem is uh, related to the Brooks membrane and its vicinity. Therefore, uh, with the donated eye, we were able to remove the retina and that's what you see on the upper left corner. Uh, uh, because it's a globe, we had to make incisions to flatten this out. And basically what you see is the very periphery is really where the retina ends. And the center, this little dot, is where the optic nerve leaves. And what's in between is basically the whole eye. Because we are doing uh, uh, experiments uh, outside of the human body, uh, we need to do this kind of uh, incisions to get a picture. But what we can do electronically, we can stitch it back together and basically representing what a clinician would ideally see. So that is what's on the upper right hand corner. If a clinician had a perfect view of your Brooks membrane, then that's how it would look like. And therefore, we can now directly relate what we are looking at on this image with what they were looking at in the clinical situation. I might just add the laser pointer. Hopefully that helps a little bit more. So this near infrared image is a perfect match to the, uh, to the, um, the image which we generated under the microscope. So we can compare like with like uh, in this situation. So it's an obvious question. What is it that you see in a, a similarly age, aged eye? An eye which has no uh, obvious pathology. Now, as you all know, well, I'm experiencing it more and more with aging, that uh, not everything is uh, perfect when you are aging anyway. And therefore we took an eye which had no previous known pathology and compared it what happens in pseudosantoma elasticum. The tools that we discovered through looking at age-related macular degeneration is, uh, are, are very important for this research. So we identified several molecules that can bind to the calcification and produce a very intensive fluorescent light. These are these white little flecks everywhere in the aged eye. And these little dots represent what we all have with aging is uh, drusen deposition. But what I'd like to highlight to you that even uh, an eye with no obvious uh, disease, the Brooks membrane actually start calcifying. So what we see probably in pseudosantoma elasticum is an accelerated version of this uh, aging uh, phenotype. And when you look at this eye with pseudosantoma elasticum on the right side, all those bright spots shows you well, and lines that it's a very, very intensive calcification. So calcification is present in the aged eye, but what you see in uh, pseudosantoma elasticum is a very intense, very strong uh, calcification. I really like the example that Sarah gave you about the eggshell. If you, when you peel the egg after boiling and you try to flatten out that eggshell, what you find is it start crackling up and you will have a flat uh, surface, but with lots of cracks on it. And that's exactly what we saw in this patient who had very uh, advanced um, pseudosantoma elasticum. What you see these little lines, some of you may not see it as well, so I make it a little bit bigger. There are these cracks everywhere that are basically artificial cracking because we were flattening this eggshell out. But in the same time, we do see the angioid streaks 
that are also present, these dark lines here. And in this eye, we have a very extensive atrophy next to the optic nerve covering the macula uh, or the foveal area. So this will have caused very severe uh, visual loss. So when we take this tissue a little bit further and uh, we now can take this under a microscope that has very high resolution of micron uh, size resolution. In the aged eye, we, we, we call these little flaks uh, as snowflakes. They look exactly like snowflakes. So when you are when we are aging, uh, we definitely have these um, uh, calcification of Brooks membrane happening, whether we like it or not. But they are very different in between these blue areas these blue areas are still healthy Brooks membrane. You can see these brighter lines are actually the vessel walls. So there is good blood flow and there is good nutrition to the retina. But in a, PIX, a PXE patient, what you see these very intensive lines represent those cracks. And we took a long, it took a long time for us to realize that these are artifactual uh, uh, staining of these cracks and basically the whole area is calcified but because of a very particularly interesting feature of calcification or hydroxyapatite deposition is that it's able to bind proteins lipids and nucleic acids so dna uh, and, and and rna and these green uh, colorations basically mean that this whole area is covered by a layer of material that should not be there. And the consequences of this, I will show you in a minute. So because every one of us have two eyes, uh, if we take one eye and flat mount it, which I showed you before, then we can have a global view. But if we section these, we will have a very particularly high resolution uh, uh, opportunity or opportunity to show this in high resolution. This is not dissimilar, this picture, what Sarah showed you using optical coherence tomography. But this time the colors represent different um, uh, uh, labels that label nuclei, that is blue. Uh, red shows you vessels. And the pink or magenta in the middle is the calcification. And what we started to see is a very interesting thing, which I'd like to highlight to you. One is that in the macular region, there is basically, and this is a higher magnification of the central pit, that the whole Brooks membrane is very intensely labeled. There are cracks on them. And for example, here you can see a vessel just about growing in to this area between the retina and the Brooks membrane. These fibers are the, the, the actual scar tissue with lots of vessels that either can support the retina above or not anymore and atrophy sets in. One of the things that we don't see next to these Brooks membrane, calcified Brooks membrane, is the microcapillaries. These are big capillaries that are part of the choroidal structure, but underneath the retinal pigment, uh, sorry, the Brooks membrane, there should be tiny vessels that actually support the uh, retina and the, uh, the, especially the photoreceptors and the retinal pigment epithelium. So what happens here, when you have this intensive calcification, materials start binding to, to the surfaces anyway and slow the uh, nutrition of the retina through the blood. But also because there is no communication between the retina and the underlying vasculature, the new vessels start growing in through here. So there are a double, basically there is a double whammy here that because of the Brooks membrane is uh, becoming impenetrable, there is already a problem with nutrition 
and clearance from the retina. But in the same time, it becomes so inflexible that it breaks and produces the scarring, the new vessel formation, and in the same time, the loss of cell layers and the development of the atrophy that Sarah talked about. So if we take a whole wedge, we start exploring how this happens, which is the direct correlation to what Sarah was talking about. Where is calcification, how intensive, and what do we see? This is from the optic nerve. Here is a big scar. And then we are going out towards to the end of the retina at the left-hand side. We analyze these with different methodologies, which can directly tell us how much calcium and how much phosphate there is. And I haven't spoken about this before, but it's important to realize this calcification actually means the formation of a compound called hydroxyapatite. And what you need to know about hydroxyapatite, it is making your teeth and making your bone. So clearly, this is an extremely stiff and very hard material to get rid of. And obviously that is good for the bone and the teeth that you can't get rid of it, but it's very bad for the eye. On the lower section, what you see is lots of new vessels, which are these red colorations. And that is because it's coming from an angioid streak. If I make it a little bit bigger, you can see these big angioid streaks. The red is the vessels growing into the retinal space. But the reason for these angioid streaks is because this whole central area is completely calcified. So imagine that eggshell in your eye, basically a continuous layer. But it's also interesting that it goes to a certain extent and then it stops and there is a much more mottled uh, calcification, which is uh, uh, likely to be corresponding. Well, in fact, we know that it corresponds to the pearl orange. So there is a transition phase whereby the full calcification or full hydroxyapatite formation actually goes into a much less extensive uh, calcification, but it's very likely based on the uh, cases we have the opportunity to explore is that this is a continuous process as Sarah explained. It starts around the optic nerve head and starts spreading first as a, an increasing uh, level of pedo orange and eventually that pedo orange, so this patchy calcification becomes an eggshell, which is a continuous layer with uh, big fragility. Oops. So if we go back to the sections. Imari, uh, sorry, yep. we have one more minute and then we have a meeting using this same Zoom. Oh, okay. Okay. I try to, to be very quick then. So basically what I wanted to say that the, the thinner the calcification, the better the health of the tissue here, you can see these microcapillaries, despite the fact that there is still calcified tissue. So why is this important? Uh, it is because what the notion is from the clinical as well as the, the, the research aspect, that this is a continuously evolving process, starting at the optic nerve head, continuously spreading to the periphery, and the extent of calcification will make this uh, area extremely fragile. I told you before that hydroxyapatite binds proteins and lipids. So if we can stop this calcification happening, that's going to make this whole uh, process uh, very approachable. And one extra very important information which we learned from this study is that when we are looking at this continuous calcification, Unlike in the skin where it's concentrating, the calcification concentrates on the elastic layer. In the Brooks membrane, which is formed by a collagen, elastin, collagen triplex, in the center, both the collagen and elastin layers are calcified. 
while in the more peripheral areas, which is left less affected, it's likely to be primarily affecting the collagen layer and not not the elastin yet. So it's a bit different than what happens in the skin, but it's not dissimilar. What this actually tells us that if we can capture and slow the calcification, then we would be able to interfere with this disease early and that could slow the progression significantly. And you might know that's not what we want, that you would be worried about treatment, but nevertheless, the hardening calcification could actually be stopped if we start early enough. And I just like to finish up with a really good news that we recently, uh, this extremely established uh, investigators like Jose Luis Milan, you know, um, and, and, and some physical chemists, uh, we teamed up and got a, a significant program grant from the National Institute of Health. This is just starting, and hopefully we will be able to give some very important information uh, soon on how calcification happens in the molecular level and translate that through animal and cellular systems to, to as, as, as a study. And finally, the very last thing, uh, soon we are going to have uh, our first meeting of the International Society for Ectopic Calcification in Belfast. And this newly formed society will hopefully contribute a lot to help patients with pseudosomatoma elasticum. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. So unfortunately, we are totally out of time. We're three minutes over and I have people waiting to come in to the next Zoom meeting. Uh, I want to thank both of you uh, to the PXers. If you have any questions, you can send them to me and I'll make sure they get to our illustrious speakers. So thank you for sharing your evening with us and uh, have a good night. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.